Hello, uh, I'm David Hills and you, if I'm not very much mistaken, are a geologist who wishes to present a core workshop virtually on camera. Uh, you know your rocks, you know what you're looking at there, you're, you understand uh, your presentations, but what you're having a little bit of uh, uh, difficulty in getting going on is how to put the technical side of cameras, microphones, lighting, all that together. And uh, I found myself, along with my co-presenter Ava Drive, uh, in the same position about this time last year. We were just gearing up to present our core workshop and that got scuttled thanks to COVID, along with so many other things. And um, after a few months of just kind of not knowing really what we were going to do, if at all, we were just going to postpone it. How long would that be? You don't know. Uh, I eventually thought, well, hang on, I do know how to use a camera here and I've used editing programs a couple of times. So let's put those two uh, together and actually create a virtual workshop which we can film and then present as, as, as a live event, but with, with pre-recorded content in there from the CRC. And you know what? It worked like a treat. We sold out. It was, uh, we got great reviews of it, yada, yada, yada and um, we were really pleased. So CSPG has asked me to kind of um, present how I've gone about that task, how I've put the stuff together. First question I think you should be asking yourself is, um, do you, why would you do this? It was about two very intensive months for me and Ava to put these together. We obviously had to rent core tables at the core lab, at the CRC, go out there. We had to record these sessions, which we thought, you know, were down pat, but when you have to do it in front of a camera, it becomes an awful lot more daunting and you realize how much time you spend saying um and uh and, and let me think about that for a second. Well, that you don't have time for that when you're watching uh, a video and those things kind of have to be cut out. Um, so it's a lot of work and what are the payoffs for it? Uh, I absolutely think it was worth that time that we spent doing this because the payoffs were enormous. First of all, obviously having a video feed of what you're showing on the camera lasts longer than uh, the workshop itself. You can reuse this. Obviously it was a lot of work this time for the first time we've presented this workshop next time i don't have to do that again we can use those uh films again and again and again and the, it's geology it's not going to rage not that quickly another reason is that you have a record of going through the rock after being very very well prepared for it and if we go back to normal completely, and I can compl and I can understand, you know, a little bit down the road that people really want to see the core, they want to go to the CRC, they want to hold it up and touch it, you know, maybe having a virtual workshop doesn't have that huge longevity of being able to do run courses for local people. Well, you've got that record of that core on video. And you can review that as a, as a presenter just to remind yourself bef the day before you're going, to, uh, you're going to run your course and just remind yourself what's in that core. You know, it just helps with that preparation work and it helps you pull out the salient points when you're back with your, you're back with your peeps at the CRC. And the third reason is, well, you know, it takes geography out of the equation, doesn't it? You don't have to be, you know, if, if you're a student in, uh, and if you're a student who wishes to attend the course, it doesn't matter where you are, you can be anywhere around the world. And if you wanna run your course for people overseas, there's nothing stopping you now. Just having this video content allows that to uh, uh, allows that to take place. It really helps you monetize some of your efforts here in being able to expand your audience to a much larger area area than just the folks here around here in Calgary. That's that's really quite important. And finally, of course, your students themselves could also benefit from having the chance to re-watch some of the content that you've provided during the day. 
And we've done that with our core workshop. We have all of those videos set on a, a website online and available to our students for a two month period after the workshop itself. You're, uh, you know, a lot of you are, your students are going to be busy. They're going to be, uh, you know, uh, distracted by phone calls and that kind of thing. Give them the chance to actually make sure that they get every ounce of content out of your day, out of your workshop. So there's a lot of value to this. And I think, yeah, beyond the COVID thing, there's certainly a number of reasons why you'd still want to think about doing all this. Right. That's why you want to do it. Now, how do you do it? Okay. To cover this, I thought it was best to actually go to the place where it all happens. So let's head off to the CRC right now, the Core Research Center, and uh, check out how to set up and how to film. Okay, we're at the CRC. It's really quiet here. We're kind of mid COVID with our face masks if we're anywhere uh, close to each other here. And we're in the 20s today at the very front. We've got the nice uh, window in front of us to give us great lighting. What we're doing here today is um, we're filming a call work through, walk through. Uh, actually, let me introduce to you our um, geology student, Dilpreet here. Dilpreet's been working with us at Enhanced Energy for the last three months. He's been doing a project on some core, doing core, disp uh, core uh, descriptions for us. And at the end of that, we wanted to have a, a presentation that we could show the rest of our group, uh, my group, mostly engineers. And so instead of being able to bring them over here, which we can't because of COVID, we're bringing it to them and hence the video virtual workshop here. A little extra editing for me to do. So the first thing we're going to do is kind of get to grips with what we're actually presenting. And you may be very, very familiar with the material that you're going to be presenting here. You've seen the core a hundred times, but it can be a little bit different when you're sitting in front of the camera trying to talk to it. This is the fifth time I've said this, by the way, just case in point. So you know exactly what I'm talking about. And although you know, you'll know exactly kind of the the uh, route that you want to talk about the core, unless you actually have a script out there, it is a little bit more difficult than you think. So what we've done today is we've gone through this core a couple of times before we uh, attempt to film for the first time and do things like we'll put post-it notes on the side of the boxes here as we're walking through so Dilpreet can see what uh, the things he wants to talk about as the core kind of as he walks through the core from one side to the other and so to be very familiar with it and that will make your presentation a lot snappier a lot sharper it makes the editor a lot happier as well because there's less to cut out okay so that's what you do before you start here now let's talk about the actual getting the image now the camera is going to be the most uh, expensive piece of the toolkit that you use for this. On the plus side though, most people have something. Most people have a, 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 a digital camera that they use for holiday snaps. That's, you know, let's say about less than five years old. And any of those things will probably take very, very reasonably quality, very, very good quality um, HD video. And that's all you need. We don't need to go full hog there. And uh, you know, just just a reasonable camera like this. This is the Canon SL1. Uh, it's the smallest SLR that Canon do. And again, the, this is the bottom of the line for SLRs. And if you have something like this, perfectly adequate for this type of work. Uh, now, uh, I've placed one camera that you're looking at me from uh, on top of a tripod and I've placed that tripod at eye level. Remember what we're trying to do here is to um, virtually simulate what your student is going to see as you're talking to the camera here. So we have one camera on a fixed tripod stand that is at a wide angle and showing as much of the core as possible. Now you can't see the details of the core through this camera. That's not important. This camera is what I call my camera one and what it's there for 
is basically for three, uh, is three roles it has. First of all, it allows me to talk to you and it allows your presenter to talk directly to the student. And when you are explaining things that you're, you're not wanting people to focus directly on the core to, then talk to this camera one. So it gives you an eye point, an eye level to, to talk to your students. And that's why this camera is actually fixed pretty much at my eye level. The second reason is what I call geography of the, of the scene and it helps the viewer remember whereabouts along the core section that we're looking at. So at the beginning of the filming we're at this side and we slowly move back to the far end of the core from top to bottom. Having this camera showing the whole scene like that allows the viewer kind of subconsciously to keep track of where you are when you're looking at this core. And the third reason is basically to edit out any mistakes that you're going to see on the detailed core because you know, you're holding this, this uh, my second camera up at a high at arm's reach. Things get blurry, things are not quite as they seem, Some uh, things are quite not quite as clear and and steady as I want from time to time and I can pop back to this camera in the editing process afterwards just to cut out that uh, you know scene changes effect in effect as I'm moving from one piece of core to another we don't want to be watching kind of blurry unshaky images all the way through okay so that's my first camera my second camera is my trusty iPad and I love using this for the detailed core work uh, for uh, again for a couple of reasons the first one is that it has a lovely huge screen that allows me to focus just by tapping that screen and uh, making sure that I'm staying in focus as, as uh, throughout here remember we're, we're we are changing our viewpoint from detail work down here to sometimes at arm level as high as I can get and even though I can't really see the screen I can tap on that and I'll ensure that I'm actually getting a good focus on the core as we're moving, changing focal lengths here. Uh, plus, uh, it, as I, it's a big screen, so I can actually see it. Some of these smaller cameras with their small LEDs, LCD screens are a little bit tougher to actually make sure that we're focused. So this is really the, the important camera uh, for, the, for the workshop because this is showing you the details. So it is important to keep that in focus. And I find that with a pad like this, that's a little bit easier. Uh, just one word of caution when setting up two cameras to uh, merge uh, later on in the editing process is that you'll want to make sure that they're at the same frame rate. And uh, if you can't change one thing, like I can't change the frame rate for my iPad here, which is at 30 frames a second, then change the, your, uh, your, um, your video camera. Um, so in this case, I've changed my video camera from my uh, default of about 20, of 24 frames a second to 30 frames a second. And that is something that you need to do because when you get to editing process and you put these two video streams together, the, ca the computer has a very hard time interpolating the one video uh, set to the other set in as far as frames per second. So you need to give that a bit of a helping hand. All right, so that's our video. Um, sound, let's talk about sound. On the top of this camera here, I've got a little telescopic mic. It's fairly cheap. It's kind of low end of the, um, uh, uh, of the cost of, of these type of things. You can certainly go much more expensive. But this does about 80% of the way I want for the job because the microphone on these cameras is very, very small. It's utility only. And the sound that you get from it is pretty muffled. So don't use uh, the microphone inside the camera. You need a microphone at least on, the, on top of the camera or even better, like I've got here, I've got this little lav mic that allows me to uh, capture the sound from close to my voice and by doing that you isolate the speaker from a lot of the extraneous sounds. Remember we're in the CRC here, it's really quiet today but it's, it's not always like this. You've got core tables being pushed out, you've got people walking through, the doors all seem to slam horribly loudly. It's amazing when you're, uh, when you're looking for this. So actually having good sound on your, on your um, uh, uh, 
at, uh, so having good sound available to you is really important. And this lav mic is a wired one. Uh, again, not terribly expensive, and I attach it to um, an old iPhone that I have that has a, a jack on it, and that um, just acts as a little recording, uh, 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 a little recorder for me. Okay, we're in the 20s section of the CRC. That's the one on the far side. Uh, this room actually has some pretty good lighting at the very front, and but you don't always get the choice about where you're placed in the CRC when you get here. And lighting is an issue. For the core itself though, we've got these overhead lights. They're really good neutral lights. They light up the core quite adequately for our purposes here. But the problem I find is it's kind of dark for the presenter. And outside of this glow of uh, light we get on the core tables, this area is pretty much lit by strip, by kind of sickly orangey yellow globes around here. Uh, so I just want to show you this. I've got two lights set up here. And if we turn those on to this, and it allows you to focus a little bit more on the presenter and it kind of makes your video production just that little bit better. So although I know it, I've, I know I go a little bit over the top with these things and um, I, you know, I have this, for, for, for this equipment for photography, these two lights cost me just over $100 on Amazon. So they're not horrendously expensive but they do bring up your production values just that little bit more. And I do really think that they're worth it. So uh, consider lighting, especially when you're further back here in the dullest part of the CRC, it really helps. Okay, uh, you wanna talk about the elephant in the room here? Uh, my hair in that video? Yeah, that was like two days ago and I've had it cut since then. And uh, I've been waiting, you know, basically a month over the point at which I should have had that cut. So uh, it's a, that's a continuity error. There we go, learn something new every day, eh? Anyway, there was a couple of other errors in here. Um, one of the things was my sound, as I was doing my piece about lighting, and uh, I hit record on my trusty little um, recorder here, and then instantly hit uh, stop as I was putting it back into my pocket. Luckily enough, I had the other camera uh, mic'd up, so that was okay. And the other thing was, you know, uh, during one of those uh, uh, talk to camera pieces, the, the camera stopped working, the battery ran out, and we ended up not getting about uh, five minutes of, of me talking about other stuff that I wanted to, uh, to show you. Uh, so that other stuff that I didn't get to uh, in that video, um, this is one of those things. Uh, this is a little macro lens. It fits right on top of your phone like so. And this just gives you the ability to do really nice, fine um, uh, microscopic kind of views of the rock. And it's really quick and easy to do. This little hood on the end of the lens here lets you put your camera just on top of the rock there and keeps it right in focus, in nice sharp focus. Uh, the downside of these things is that, as you see in this case, it fits my old iPhone 5, which I don't use apart from using for this type of work. And that doesn't fit on my, uh, my new phone. So for my new phone, where is it? I got this one. I didn't want to spend as much money again as I did last time. So I got this one. It was quite cheap on Amazon. About $18, I think. A little clip-on thing by a company called Cobra Tech. And this clips right onto any phone or iPad. And uh, it is very, it, you can use it on, on any different machine there. And it's good, but you know what? It's missing that little clear plastic thing that keeps things in focus as you rest them down on the on, on the rock there. So uh, when I'm using this, you can see my focusing is a little bit out, a little bit shaky. 
The other thing I'm using here is a recording program on my old iPhone here. Uh, this is called Voice Recorder Pro. There's lots like it for, for different makes, for, for different platforms here. This was a free thing. I think the, the phone has its own uh, voice recorder on there as well, so you can use that. And I use that uh, because um, I don't want a wire going through from my camera to uh, the presenter which would have to go over on top of the core and become a problem when we're actually videoing. So the best thing is to have kind of a remote little uh, attachment like this. And again, it's, it's an old phone, so it was no extra cost. And, um, uh, and then put those together later on in the editing, which is an extra added, it's an added step but I don't want to spend the money on radio mics and all those kind of things. So uh, I'm just not doing this type of thing enough to, to warrant that cost and probably neither are you. So you might want to record a few videos after you've done your course shoot, like I am here at home uh, doing a lecture maybe. Ava's done a couple of those and uh, we've added those to the content that we supply to our students. And what we use for this is a, 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 a software called Debut Professional by NCH Software and it's available on PC and Mac for around, I'm gonna say $50. If not, I'll be correcting it here. And it just allows you to capture your whole screen. It allows you to capture, uh, say if you want to do a PowerPoint presentation and uh, you can have a, a, your video stream from a webcam up on the corner there. And uh, basically then it saves that as a video file which you can then add to your edits afterwards. So that's really kind of handy content there. We use that for a, a number of things. I'm actually using that right now. Right, so once you have all of these video files, uh, one quick word of caution is to make sure that you are very meticulous in organizing all of these files. You can imagine that with two cameras, uh, audio files, screen captures, video from your uh, desktop, it can get very overwhelming very quickly if you don't keep those files very separated into each of the projects that you're doing. And uh, so that's my word of advice quickly is just make sure that when you finish a fi uh, film, the first thing you should really do when you get home after the, uh, from the core lab is to put those into individual files. If you don't do that and you end up with multiple days worth of a video on your cards and things like that, it gets really, really complex because the video doesn't show you necessarily what you're working on. You have to screen through it all and it gets really, really, it, it's, it, it's a nightmare. Don't do it. Just uh, organize those things when you when you get back to your office afterwards. Right, maybe you wanna add some uh, stills images to your videos as you're doing your walkthrough. And the best way we found to do this is just to do a quick capture of them in PowerPoint and annotate them in PowerPoint and then screen capture that to a JPEG that's then placed into your video file. This, by the way, has been a really easy way for Ava and I to collaborate on this project is that after my first draft of the video, she would then pop into that, create a timestamp, just the, the, the time uh, along the video that she wanted to include a, an annotation or a, uh, an image. And then in PowerPoint, we would have that image with uh, annotations in it and then send it back to me and I can easily see what time to put it in make a screenshot of the relevant area and then place it back into the video just where, where we wanted it to be. And everybody knows how to use PowerPoint. It's a very easy thing to, a, a very easy thing to use. Video editing is probably the steepest learning curve you're gonna have in all of this uh, process. It is not the most intuitive uh, thing to do if you haven't done it before. And there's a wealth of different programs that you can use out there for video editing. I use um, Adobe Premiere because uh, I have it for Photoshop and, I, and Lightroom and I use it for those two things as well. So it, Premiere comes in with that package. It is a little bit expensive though and um, it does way more than I'd ever really need to do. So 
if you're just starting off, one good way of uh, getting into this is by a smaller program. I know NCH, the company that does the uh, screen capturing software that I use, also has a, a video editor for around $70. Alternatively, for a little bit more, uh, you can go for Adobe's uh, Premiere Elements. Uh, Premiere Elements is uh, just a stripped down version of their pro version, and it should do about 70, 80% of the things you need. Absolutely does all the raw basic um, laying out of, of films and uh, editing, uh, the editing suite there has most of what you want. So I would suggest starting off on that. Also, it's $100 for a purchase. You're not in a subscription um, series there like I am with, with the uh, cloud software, which is a little bit annoying, I've got to admit. And uh, if you get to learn that, you can then jump up to Premiere Pro like I did, uh, you know, if, if you get a little bit more serious about this later on. But certainly Premiere Elements is a good way to start. Okay, so you've edited your videos, you've got a file folder there with all your videos numbered in order as they're going to be shown to your students. Now you're going to present it. So the next question of software is on what uh, platform do you use? Uh, CSPG were very uh, kind in setting up this for us for our workshop and we used GoToMeeting for, for that workshop there and it ran very smoothly. We were able to have good open discussions with our students and then when the time came we could share our screen with the rest of the students and just press play and then at the end of that, come back to the students afterwards. And, you know, it's a little bit nerve wracking when this is your, 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 your bottleneck to the, re to the viewers that are going to be watching it, but you get the hang of it after a while. GoToMeeting was great. I also hear that Zoom also works very, very well. Of course, you're going to have, you know, hopefully up 10, 20, even more students in this, and it's going to be for the whole day. So you're not going to get away with the freebie versions of these programs. You're going to have to pay for them. Um, and so, you know, the, the base level of, of these uh, things should allow you to do the, um, a webinar just like this, just like you want to. And should be, uh, 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 and that's all you really need is just uh, something to allow you to talk to multiple people and share your screen. And one of the big benefits of having all of your content as a video is that you can have that video for your students to view after the date of the workshop. And certainly we uh, got a lot of feedback from our students that, that this came in handy. It's hard to uh, pay attention to a workshop for a student all day long. You've got other things coming in, you've got phone calls, all this and that. So to be able to uh, guarantee that they're not gonna miss anything by having some of this content set out for them on a video sharing website is very, very handy. Now I've got my um, my photography website that I've had for about 10 years, which we use for our workshop. This has been really good. Uh, it's hosted by Smug Mug, and I pay about $120 a year for this. But again, I use that, I have that already for my own purposes. And it seems a shame to get a whole different um, website in just for the video content. The downside to this is that uh, Smug Mug only allows you to put up a 20 minute video at one time. Uh, and some of my content is up to 30 minutes I found for these walkthrough videos. Usually 20 minutes does it for most of them, but there's a few where that becomes a little bit restrictive. An alternative is Vimeo. Uh, Vimeo allows you to upload video content. It allows you to have, like SmugMug, a password protected site, so only your students can see it. And it doesn't have adverts like uh, YouTube. Uh, so you again, this is another pay for subscription. There, 
it is adding to these costs of doing a, a, a workshop. However, remember, this is where your content is going to reside. You want to make sure it's safe. You want to make sure that only the people that you want to see it can see it. And, uh, you know, for that, you're going to have to probably pay a small subscription price like uh, like for Vimeo there. Anyway, that's uh, that's it for what I've got. Um, if you're watching during uh, the live webcast, then uh, I hope to answer some of your questions. And if you're watching on YouTube after the fact, well, uh, just wrap up by saying um, that the content for start for uh, classes has really dropped off this year for very obvious reasons. And societies like the CSPG and others like them are really uh, in need of, of filling that, that, that teaching gap that, that usually uh, provides to, uh, to the community at large. And right now, this is the best way of doing it. So we hope that uh, you have a go at this. It's uh, difficult in spots. It can be a, a bit of a, uh, some hard work in places, but the payoffs are pretty big. So good luck and happy making. Thanks.